start recording. Okay, so in Ephesians chapter 5, let's go ahead and read through the chapter. We'll start in verse 1. So in Ephesians 5, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God, as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not once be named among you, as becometh saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now you are in light in the Lord. Walk as the children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject, excuse me, be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his lot wife loveth himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, and his flesh, and his of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I think we should focus on those last lines. <laughs> all right may god add his blessing to the reading of his word Amen. all right so let's just start out looking at the first couple of verses now we remember in the last chapter right it talked about eternal security it talked about how you're sealed until the day of redemption by the holy spirit he said that you you'll grieve the holy spirit if you don't live a holy and righteous life if you don't follow the teachings of Christ and of Paul and the whole Bible, but you cannot lose it. You are sealed till the day of redemption, a seal of God. How can you break the seal of God? Very interesting question. People have debated it for centuries. I don't believe it's possible, but now let's take a look at how you're supposed to live. If you're living right, it should never be a question for Christians where they say, well, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want. If that's your statement, if that's your opinion, you may have a problem. Your question should be, I'm saved, so I need to try to work harder every day to do whatever he wants. Not because you're sealed, but because you're grateful for what he did. That first part you said is taking license. Taking license to sin. That's exactly right. It's not what we ought to do. Jim, can you uh, say something? I do have a question. It's a concern that I have, and I don't know 
you know, you read these things and it says, if you do these things, da, 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 you shall not enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. When was all that talked about? When? Yeah. So the question, so the point is, whenever it talks about, there's two different things you're going to find throughout the scripture. You're going to find people that are told you shall never see the kingdom of God. Right. And there are people who say, like in this passage, you have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Okay. So the point being, and I guess one of the best analogies I love is there's a big difference. Me and you and Paris Hilton can all stay in a Hilton, right? We can all go today and stay in a Hilton. But there's a big difference between staying in a Hilton and inheriting the Hilton, right? We can all get in. So think of heaven, it's much better than the Hilton. But the point being, there's a difference whether you're allowed in and whether you inherit everything, right? The Bible's very clear, and a lot of people, and I think it would be a great study. I don't know how much information there really is, but it'd be an interesting study to dig out the economy of heaven, what we know and what we can know. We know that in heaven, there are things of value that people bring to God as a offering. We know there are people who dwell in the new Jerusalem, and we know there are people who dwell in the new earth. We know that there are your works that are put up. And the works are burned. And if they're gold or silver or bronze, you know, they, they, burn, they last through the fire. But if they're wood, hay, or stubble, they get burnt up. But the Bible's clear. If your works are all bad, hay, and stubble, you suffer loss, but your soul is saved. Paul makes that very clear. So there is definitely an economy. And there's definitely things we can lose. Remember what Jesus says? Don't store up your treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Store up your treasures in heaven. Well, if we can both store treasures, can you not store more than me? Paul even says, run the race. Many run, but only one wins. Just reach for the goal. He's not saying only one person gets to heaven. He's saying one person receives the rewards. So you need to work as if every day mattered for Christ. Does that make sense? Um, absolutely. But I was always just confused on the difference in, in and I guess your analogy pretty much cleared it up for me mm -hmm. you either inherit it or but you can you, you can go regardless right i mean the, you know the where people talk about the mansions in heaven some people say well i'm going to be out like shane always says i'll be on the outskirts of town and you know I'll be beyond the train tracks or whatever mm -hmm. the point being heaven's going to be fantastic there's not going to be any unhappy soul in heaven but god is coming and his reward is in his hand right? Eternal security, sorry, salvation is a gift. Salvation is a gift. You did nothing to earn it. If you think the reward he's going to give you for good works is salvation, you are wrong. But if you understand, on the other hand, salvation was the gift, but the works do come with rewards, then it clears up so much. If you look at people who believe in loss of salvation, you can find every passage, and in every passage, it talks about reward, inheritance, those who have tasted of the heavenly gift, but refused it, right? I mean, there's so many passages. And again, it's a long and good study and everyone ought to do it for themselves. But at the end of the day, if something is a gift, I did nothing to earn it. All I had to do was accept it, period. If it can be taken away, it's not a gift. If it was given to me, it's a gift. If it can be taken away, I have to maintain it. But then again, that's a good study for another time. I hope that, that makes sense of it. It did. It, it, yeah. Yeah, it helped a lot. Thank you. All right, so then let's jump into chapter 5, and let's see how we ought to be living. So verse 1 and 2. Be ye, therefore, followers of God, as dear children. It's like my dear children kept running up and down the hallway, screaming their lungs out just a minute ago. It's so sweet to hear. I see they're watching their movie. <laughs> um, it says, and walk in love as Christ has loved us. And has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So Paul's giving this advice to the church that you should be devoted to God like children are devoted to their parents. Maybe when they're younger. This today, my youngest daughter, Evangeline, she would just sit there at the feet of Carly and cry. Why was she crying? Because her mommy wasn't holding her. I mean, she's right here sitting beside her, but that's not the same as holding her. Mm -hmm. she's just desperate for mommy to hold her 
because she wants to be as close as humanly possible to her mother. Now, eventually they grow out of it and they want to stay as far away from you as they can. But the point being, a child, when they're young, follows wherever you lead. A baby that's crawling, go around the corner. They'll either cry or keep looking for you. They'll come around the corner looking for you, right? They don't always obey, but whenever they're scared, whenever they're nervous, what do they do? Head for mom, Head for mom right? Head for the parents. And whether parents want to admit it or not, our kids are little reflections of us. They mimic us. They do what we do. See what I'm saying? Whenever a kid's upset, they run for it. It's a perfect example. I, she's doing perfect there. So the point being, whenever we use the word for followers, be followers of Christ, the, the word followers is the word memetes, right? Memetes is what it says, be followers. Be mimickers of Christ. It's the same word as mime or mimic, right? Yes, I have the ESP and it says imitators. Imitators, perfect. It's another good word. So we're supposed to be imitating Christ. So guess what? I'm not going to say I know any kids that do this. But let's just assume for a minute there was a kid that rolled their eyes regularly. Or let's just say that when a kid's frustrated, they're like, where do you think they might have picked that up? <laughs> I won't say anybody's wife who raised their hand. But the point being, that's the fact is, kids are rolling their eyes. Hey, can you tell Evie to go upstairs? Um, so when they're imitating, the, you got to look at your own actions first. That's the first thing that you look at. When a kid's being hypocritical, guess what? They might not have learned that outside the home. So we are supposed to imitate God. Why? We got to know how God is. We got to know how he lives, how he behaves. And once we understand where his heart is and where his love is, our heart can become more like him. But too many Christians, they want to try and be like Christ without spending any time with Christ. Mm -hmm. They want to spend six hours a day on Facebook or watching a movie or watching TV shows, spend 20 minutes a day with Christ and say, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ. That's not how it works. That's not at all how it works. Kids become like us because they spend their time with us. And kids, whenever they get into school and they start imitating the people at school, guess what? They're no longer behaving like us. And sometimes it's very bad. They get into themselves into a lot of trouble. So a quick story about my father. Who my father, if I could, if I could take all I know about the Bible and all that I've studied over my short career, reading the Word of God and reading, you know, commentaries and all these different things, it might equal three percent of what he knows maybe eh, maybe two percent let's just be generous here but two to three percent i would say of what he knows this man a giant of the faith he came to christ around the time he got married right as he was kind of you know seeing my mom decided you know that he's going to come to christ well he used to smoke cigarettes right it was pretty common in lebanon people would smoke cigarettes and he used to smoke um, well, one day, he kept thinking about quitting and why he should quit. But one day, my oldest sister, his firstborn daughter, snuggled up beside him, and she pulled out a cigarette. And she's like, I want to smoke one, Dad. So guess what my dad did? He turned around, flung it out of his hand, never picked up another cigarette. Mm. Why? Because he saw the little eyes, he saw the little hands and the little feet, that were watching what he was doing. And all the things he told them about, it's not good to smoke, it's not good to do this, didn't matter. What mattered is what it was you were doing. So again, what does it, what does it come to leadership? My parents, none of my brothers and sisters ever got into cigarettes, drugs, alcohol, none of that stuff. Why? Because we were all naturally good kids and we have great parents, right? We had great parents that were good, godly influence in our life. So I don't know if you've ever heard the song by Casting Crowns called Slow Fade. Very, very good song. But it just tells you nobody just wakes up one morning, says, okay, now I'm going to be evil and start sinning. No, it always starts out with something small. And you step one step, one step, one step. And our children mimic us. So children are supposed to mimic their father, right? So we got to understand that when we live in a holy and righteous way, when we never go to bed without praying, when we never spend the day without reading the Bible with our family, our kids see that. They recognize that. 
I am not being critical, but I would be hard pressed to say that the average Christian family reads the Bible on a daily basis. I don't think it's true. I think it used to be true. I don't think it's true anymore. I would say it's extraordinarily rare that the family gets together to say their prayers at night before they go to bed. And then we wonder, where did my kids go wrong? Well, what's the priority in your life to make it the priority in their life? And I think, again, we'd go on and on about that. But just as we remember from this book, not only are our kids watching us, but all of creation is watching us. All the angels and the fallen angels. There is a spiritual battle around us. There are people witnessing what is going on, both here and then after everybody goes home. And what we say in the evenings, what we gossip, what we talk about. All of that, the world is watching, the seen and the unseen world. So what are we supposed to be doing? Well, look what verse 1 again had said. It said, be imitators of Christ, right? So look at, you know, in Matthew chapter 5. Now again, so how is Christ telling us how to act? So I'm just going to read a few verses from Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 through 48. This is from the Sermon on the Mount. And think about what he's asking you to do. To imitate Christ. Remember, if you want to know how did Christ live on this world, read the Sermon on the Mount. It's not advice how you're going to be able to, uh, to live. It's telling you what perfection requires. And yes, it's a good guideline of how to, what we should do. But only Jesus was able to obtain those things. Be perfect like your father's perfect. So let's read Matthew 5, 44. It says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. When somebody's messing up my house, who were supposed to fix something, I paid it for and they messed it up. Am I praying for them? Or am I praying that they get theirs, right? Mm -hmm. Then what does he say in verse 45? He says, why? Why would you do all this? That you may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them that love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? If you salute your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So the next time you see yourself treating others without love, the guy that cut you off, the guy that flipped you off, the guy that stole your parking lot, the guy that hit your car, the guy that pushed you, what did Jesus do when they, when they uh, treated him that way? Remember how he was abused? He was hated. He was spit on. He was struck. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was nailed to a cross. What did he do? I'll show you. Wait till I come back. What do you say? Father, Father forgive them. Forgive. Father, forgive them. That's our father. And God would forgive them, every one of them. I think it's getting bigger, right? With the government mm -hmm. pressing in, and I'm going to do this, and we're going to take this freedom. We're going to have our opportunities. Yes. Yes. And uh, Ginger points out that we're going to have our opportunities to, to put our money where our mouth is. When the government's pressing in, when they're going to take away your rights. Well, the only right that you ought to be resisting from them taking away is the right to share Jesus Christ. That's the one right that you do not give up to meet with other brothers and sisters, to praise the Lord together, to do what God commands us to do. Other than that, listen, we're here to suffer. It's unfortunate. Nobody's looking forward to it, but it's coming. Some people will preach the opposite. They'll say, no, rise up, fight, overthrow them. There's been corrupt governments. From the dawn of time, from the time from Nimrod all the way through today, there's been corrupt governments and Christians have lived through them. And while they stand for the truth, they're not there to overthrow governments or to start civil wars. They're there to praise God and change hearts. And that ought to be our job. So what do we see in verse three? And by the way, Zoom crowd, if anybody wants anything to say, just unmute yourself and speak up. So uh, Matthew, uh, excuse me, Ephesians five, verse three says, but fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you, as becometh saints. So we ought to love people. We ought to show them love. But now we're going to see how do you contradict love? What is love? What is the contradiction of love? Okay. Fornication is one of the oldest sins. 
You'll find it all over the Bible. You'll find it all over history. You'll find it all over your town, your city today. It's everywhere, right? It's illicit relationships. Whenever you're doing something with someone, you ought not to be doing with it. If it's not your wife or your husband, you ought not to be doing it, okay? But then you have also uncleanness. How about a picture, a book, a movie, a television show that glorifies fornication, that shows nudity, that brings up things that would dishonor God? So uncleanness cannot be named among the, the, the Christians. These things destroy marriages. What is covetousness? That's desiring something that's not yours, right? That woman that you saw, that man that you saw, that house that you saw, doesn't have to be sexual. It can be anything. These are the things that destroy families. These are the things that destroy marriages. The Bible tells us that whenever it has to do with sexual sin, it's not only just a sin against God, it's a sin against your own body. It gives you an unrealistic expectation of the marriage relationship. And it drives you not to happiness, but to self-torment. You begin to say, well, why? that's what I want. That's not something that's ever going to happen, okay? These things don't happen in that way. Um, there are certain evangelists, fantastic ministries, godly people that fall prey to this, that fall prey and destroy their ministry, destroy their witness, all for what? For a few minutes satisfaction. For what's, what does all this satisfaction come down to? Self-love. Putting yourself above others. What is love? Love, all that it is, is a conscious decision to put someone else above you. Think about the creator of the universe. How did he show love? I will die so they don't have to. Let them survive. Let them be saved and I'll take the payment. That's all love is. The lo love is that I am exhausted, but I don't want the kid to wake up my wife or vice versa because I want her to rest. This is what love is all about. But instead, when it comes to fornication, well, that's all about me. What can I do for me? How can I be happy? It's a total contradiction to Christ. It's a total contradiction to love. And we ought not to be trying to gratify ourselves. So if you ever wonder, well, what does God really think about fornication? Is it really that big a deal? What does it matter if I really watch that show? Well, just remember in Numbers 25, whenever the people of Israel were encamped and they asked Balaam, hey, how can we get God to turn on them? He said, oh, just send out your pretty girls. Send out your pretty girls and the men will commit fornication. Guess what? 25,000 of them died by the hand of God. So if you want to know God's opinion, on how our relationships ought to be, take a look. You know, we won't even talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. We won't talk about how David's whole family suffered and so on and so forth. Go and take a look. Not one of these people died happy or satisfied because they had it all. They all were miserable because they fell into it. It's not worth it. Then we, so the Christians shouldn't be named among you. So then we get to verse four through seven. It says neither. So the, the sexual sins, get rid of them. Then it says, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this we know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them so when we talk our mouths are very powerful and they also have the potential for devastation words you say you say can destroy entire reputations can destroy entire lives a small gossip or rumor can destroy a family Go ahead, in verse four what, what did it say there neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient. Here, I mean, it says crude joking. Crude joking, correct. So, again, when we speak, we ought to be speaking to the glory of God. When we talk to others, it should be uplifting. It should be filled with love. Seasoned with salt is another term that's there. Salt, which sometimes the truth can be harsh. Doesn't mean it all has to be sunshine and rainbows, but it all has to be glorifying God. Don't be sharing filthy language 
crude stories, filthy stories, funny jokes that are dirty, jokes that make light of hell, make light of death. That doesn't mean you can't tell a joke, but you got to understand what is it whenever your kids hear jokes about how, oh, this man went to hell and it was fine. I've told these jokes. Man went to hell and there was a funny this and a funny that. They may be funny, but it also desensitizes us to the truth. It makes it seem like it's not that big a deal. It is a very big deal. Don't waste your time on foolish talks. Glorify Christ with every word. Show love with every word. Encourage others with every word. We talked here a couple of weeks ago about how a single statement can ruin a day or bless a day. Somebody just walking up and say, you know, I love it when you come down here because you always work hard. You always do such a great job. That person's day will be fantastic the rest of the day. And you could come by and be like, oh, gosh, it's you again. Like, really, that statement? Really? And it's hard. Sometimes we fall into these. You know, we're frustrated. We say things we don't mean. But we ought to take things seriously. Take every opportunity to share Christ. Do you truly take those opportunities? Do you take the time to share Christ? Or do we just look for time to say, oh, I just, I just, I don't want to get into it right now. We don't want to talk about it right now. So many times that's our attitude because people don't like the message of Christ. Guess what Paul did when they didn't like the message of Christ? He said, oh, okay, well, I'll see you guys later. And he left town, right? Is that what happened? Or did he keep talking until they arrested him or had to sneak him out through a basket because they were coming to kill him? He's like, I don't care. Woe unto me if I don't preach, right? So who are you scared of? People's opinion or the opinion of Almighty God? Verse 5, he warns that those who live in such a way will not receive an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He already told us in the previous chapter, if you live carnally, you're grieving the spirit, but you're sealed. Okay, salvation, again, is a free gift. We choose to live righteously in response to the gift of salvation. It's not something that you're doing to maintain it. You did nothing beyond accept the gift. That's it. Remember, whenever uh, Paul's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.19, he says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. God knows who belongs to him. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So because you're saved, get away from sin. Not stay away from sin to maintain your salvation. God knows who belongs to him. It's all over the New Testament. But that is not, as you mentioned earlier, a license to sin. If you belong to Christ, you belong to Christ. You are not your own. Stop living as if you are. Verse 8 through 10. Actually, yeah, go ahead. Um, the, you know, the course talk and everything, with all the um, systemic racism and all the stuff you hear about, mm -hmm. But, oh, but they can call each other the N word or they can do this. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. Don't, just because a black person says it to another black person, I don't like to say it that way. Like, sure, right. Like, raw shades of brown, but in their talk, mm -hmm. you, does that make it okay? No, it doesn't. Right. Because then somebody else says it, like this kind of sure. so, says it when he's drunk, which uh -huh. is whatever. Um, still wrong. You just, just don't say it, period, no matter who you're talking yes. to. Yes. So Annie I'm points gonna, out, I was going to share it with the Zoom folks so they hear what you're saying because I don't have the microphone hooked up there. And he's pointing out that we cannot just make exceptions where I might say something that's inappropriate around a group of people that are like me that would be inappropriate for, for whoever that's around me to say. That's not okay. Whenever we speak, if, if we wouldn't be okay with our children saying it, if we wouldn't be okay with our friends saying it, we ought not to be saying it. I mean, that's kind of the idea of what you're going with, especially when it comes to that. When it comes to racism, you know. With racism, with they, anything they like that. They could word that, but you said it would be wrong. Right. Well, no, it's everybody's. It's wrong no matter who says it. That's right. Have one everybody, standard. Have one standard, right? Not a different so, standard for everybody. You know, as far as, like, whether or not you can lose your salvation, you can't lose it, but you can hand it back. If you choose to live sinfully, mm -hmm. if you choose, I'm going to be a murderer. I mean, that's not living being Christ-like. You are not being a Christian in that. 
Right? I'm going to disagree. I don't think you can hand it back, but it certainly would reflect but what's you in your heart. Christ like, mm -hmm. if you truly are, you're not going to do those things. Exactly. And I think we agree 100% on that. If you, that's what I'm saying, though. You can't go, oh, my gosh, it's like in the Bible, even, I think, I remember, it was Peter or Paul said, does this mean that I can go out and just... God forbid. As much as I want? No, that's not what it means. It means right. you're trying. No, you're not going to hurt it. No, it is a gift. You can't hurt it. There's no possible way that you could do anything mm -hmm. worthy of it. And that's exactly... So that's right along those same lines. There is a passage where there are people who come before Christ. And he's saying they're, they're, it's time for the judgment. And he and they say, Lord, Lord, did we not heal in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not, you know, feed the poor? Did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he tells them, I never knew you. Because the fact is, salvation changes you. You receive the Holy Spirit. And by their fruits, you shall know them. So as Annie mentioned, if somebody goes out and wants to live in murder, hatred, you know, just being evil towards one another. Have they received the spirit of God? They might think they have, but they have never accepted. It. Because once you've accepted it, you belong to him. And it changes your life. It doesn't mean you can't fall into sin. It simply means that when you sin, the Holy Spirit won't let you forget it. You will be, you will be convicted of your sin. You need to come back to Christ. And if you don't care, well, then there's not a convicting presence. You have a problem, a major problem. So then we get to verse 8 through 10. Or did I already say this? I'm not sure. I think verse 8 through 10 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. This is exactly what Annie was saying. You used to be in the dark. Now you're in the light. The light and the dark don't mix. Walk as the children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Everything you do, Everything you think, put it to the test. Is this acceptable to God? Is this what Christ would have me do? I'm about to go in there and yell at this person for being lazy. I might need to address the laziness, but is it the way I'm about to present it? Is it going to glorify Christ? The way you dress, the jokes you tell, the work you do, the attitude you present, the heart that you bring to people, is it going to adequately and accurately reflect Christ? You are in the light. You are not in the darkness. Fruit of the Spirit. What is required for any tree to produce fruit? What does it need? It needs fertilizer. It needs the roots, right? You have to be in Christ. If you're not in Christ, you will not produce fruit. And if you produce fruit, there'll be the fruit won't taste right. If you produce fruit, if, it's, if your roots are not connected. Some plants can produce fruit after they've been cut from the tree. You cut a branch off a pear tree, it might continue to produce the pear for a little while, but the pear won't taste very good because it's cut off from the root. The point being, when you have the spirit, you produce the fruits of the spirit. And when you don't have the spirit, you produce the fruits of the flesh. I personally know a handful of people that grew up in the church that could teach the Bible as well as anyone else, but never accepted it. They walked away. They walked away from their faith. I am physically incapable of walking away from the faith. I may get angry with God. I may get frustrated. I may sin. I may do all kinds of things. But I can never walk away because I know the truth. There is no amount of evidence that's ever going to convince me that God is not true. Again, I can be frustrated in all the other things. But that is not something I can do because I am sealed till the day of redemption. And he dwells within us. Right? He dwells he's, within you. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely true. Jesus actually made the statement that his perfection is based on the fact that he will present anyone who's ever come to him on that day. On the day of judgment, he will present them safe and sound. And if he doesn't, he says, I came to do the will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? That I will present everyone who's ever come to me. Think about that. He promised that his perfect, perfect accomplishment of Jesus' will is to bring everyone that's ever come to him. That, but again, remember, many people will be surprised to find out they were never his. They will think they are. Because again, the difference, as they say, between salvation and eternal hell, I forget what it was, maybe like 12 inches. I don't know how far it is from your head to your heart. 
But there's a difference between knowing and accepting. Even the book of James tells us. The demons know, the devils know, and they shudder. Because they're not saved. They, they know who's the king. So we got to keep that in mind that you must accept Jesus Christ. All of this advice is useless if you haven't accepted Christ. You can't have good works or good fruit without the root. You need the root. So as you tell us in verse 11 through 17. says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things <clears throat> which are done of them in secret. But all these things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We used to walk in darkness, but if you've accepted Christ, you now walk in light. Mm -hmm. All of our behavior, everything we do, should be done in a way that shows that we have nothing to be ashamed of. We should do things in righteousness and in truth. Why? Because that's what's demanded of us, not because we're trying to show ourselves off. If I wouldn't watch that show with my three-year-old, maybe I ought not to be watching that show. If I wouldn't play that show at Bible study, maybe I ought not to be watching that show. I know that doesn't sound like fun. I know that doesn't sound so exciting. But hey, and I would show you all Godzilla vs. Kong. That looks awesome. But the point being, I wouldn't sit there and show you certain movies that otherwise may have passed my eyes. We should have nothing to be ashamed of. Somebody put a camera and saw the things we do when no one else is around. We should have nothing to be ashamed of. But the fact is, we do things a lot of times that we're ashamed of. We watch things. We speak things. We think things. We hate things. We do all kinds of things that we shouldn't be doing. Instead, we need to prove what is acceptable. If we're taking part with the unfruitful works of darkness and enjoying the same things the world enjoys, how is the world going to know what's acceptable to God? How are they going to know? If Hollywood produces a show full of nudity and murder and infidelity and all of these things, and the Christians are enjoying it just like the rest of the world, how is the world going to know what's right and wrong? Are they going to have any idea? Why should they? They don't have light. We have light. You know the truth. Is it changing you when the world comes together to bash someone else and gossip about someone else and hate someone else, whether they be political or local? What do we do? Do we stand up and say, you know what? I don't agree with their policy either. Let's pray for them. Do we show them what is acceptable or do we show them what we want to show them? I mean, we could go on and on. What about marriage? We want to criticize the world on what they define marriage as. What do we define marriage as? Is monogamy important? How do we prove that monogamy is acceptable when adultery is rampant in the church? How do we prove that marriage is lifelong when divorce is, a, is over abundant? I mean, there are exceptions to divorce. There are things, there are biblical uh, reasons for divorce. Abandonment, breaking of your marriage vows, adultery. There are a variety of reasons why divorce is okay. But that's not what's overcome the church. It's not because of an overwhelming abandonment. It's not because of an overwhelming breakage of a marriage vow. It's usually, I just don't like that guy anymore. I don't like that girl. No, I like someone else better, right? And it's, if we're supposed, if we're living just like the world, how is the world going to know what's acceptable? It should be the easiest thing in the world for somebody to tell the difference between a servant of God and someone that's still in darkness should be the easiest thing in the world. But I don't think it's as easy as it used to be. I think, frankly, that we live in the lukewarm age. I think we are a lukewarm church, and I don't mean that to be critical of everyone else. I'm being critical of myself, right? Should be, kind of like night and day, huh? should be night and day. That's exactly right. In other countries where there's persecution, mm -hmm. those people really stand out. Yeah, because, because it, you, you're getting persecuted for it. And Ginger's pointing out that in countries with persecution, the distinction is very stark. It's very apparent. 
we should speak against the acts of darkness and live against them. It doesn't help if I say something and go ahead and watch the show anyway. That's not how it's supposed to work. We were dead and we're now alive. The dead and the alive have clear distinctions. Really easy to tell the difference, should be. But instead we have a bunch of zombies, oh good. Um, the cat came to visit me. So again, the encouraging thing about, I just love my cat, he's great. Yeah, Hang around people that are doing things you shouldn't be doing. Yes. Because you have their influence that we don't need. Mm -hmm. And whether you realize it or not, you're going to start talking like them. Or you're, you know, like my sister moved to South Carolina, and after so many years, she started kind of developing the accent. Yeah. I mean, you do, though, you know, so you can, you're in the world, and you need to be a witness to the world, but you don't need to be of the world. Yes. The you should stand out like a sore thumb. So but your base should be Papa City Group, not. The bar mm -hmm. Or work, even sometimes work can be rough. Work, work. Yeah. Battles at work most of the time. It's where we spend most of our time. Mm -hmm. So, and he was pointing out that you should, you, whenever you go and spend time with any group, you become more like that group. But as Christians, we ought to spend so much of our thoughts, even though physically we can't be in church every day, can't be at Bible study every day, but so much of your mind should be on Christ. Every day, singing spiritual songs, hymns, as we read in the previous chapters, you should have so much of Christ in your focus that you become more like him every day. But instead, we again, we give him a little spot in our heart, a spot in our mind. No, he is our mind. He is our heart. But we were speaking about that on the, on the way down, Jimmy, in that devotion of thinking different, where Paul was, uh, gave warning about cultural cultural values mm -hmm. of who you, you know, are around and right. how you become. He became a Jew to the Jews, the Gentile to the Gentile, right? Right. And we, again, we should, we, we can't isolate ourselves from the world. That's kind of the Amish philosophy, right? That where, yes, we're going to live our Christian life, but away from everyone else. No, Christ sent his disciples to the world. Go to every city, preach the word, but don't fall into corruption. And you want to see, if you think that corruption hasn't been around since the beginning of the church, it has. Paul had to leave people behind in place after place because they kept going the wrong direction. The churches, we look back at church history. Well, the church history had to have gotten it right. Paul warned the Ephesian church, guys, once I leave, it'll be real quick. The wolves will creep in. The church is going to corrupt quickly. The only truth you have is the word of God. Stick with it. If anybody brings you anything, any gospel outside of this word, let them be accursed. There, he was so sure of how easy we would be corrupted. Who, is, who has deceived you, you foolish Galatians? As we wrote the letter to the Galatians. People want the dead and the alive. But the beautiful thing about this passage is, again, eternal security. Why? He's telling you that you have come into the light, so you can't act like the darkness because you're of the light. You can't go back into the darkness. No, you are now of the light. So start living it. You've seen the light. Nobody can open their eyes, see the world, and then close them again and forget what they've seen. It doesn't work like that. Once your eyes are open, your eyes are open. You know what you've seen. There's a lot of wisdom in whoever coined one bad apple spoils the whole one. Yeah, yeah, and it's true. Yeah. Roy points out that, you know, one bad apple spoils the bunch. It doesn't take a lot of dark influence to destroy someone's witness, to destroy someone's Christian, destroy really the evidence of their faith. And we ought to be the good apples. And whenever that bad apple, once we recognize that bad apple, walk away. Do you say your piece and walk away? If you know someone is leading you astray, walk away. It's that simple. And now, again, we can, I mean, there. I don't want to, you know, I'm not trying to offend those, but some people will say, well, if we're supposed to speak up against the uh, works of darkness, which we are, does that mean we're supposed to stand at picket lines telling people not to go into the strip club? Well, we do need to make it clear we have nothing to do with such places. But let me tell you something. If you stand at a picket line saying, don't go into the strip club and go home and flip on the TV, with the same scene before your eyes, what what exactly are you doing? 
I mean, really, what exactly have you accomplished? What's wrong is wrong. What's right is right. Don't be a hypocrite. Exactly. That's exactly right. Too often Christians talk the talk. And frankly, I think the world seen that and it's turned much of the world off. Especially the leadership. And do you admit when you've made a mistake? That's a when you're in the middle of a gossip and you realize I am gossiping right here. Do you stop right there and say, you know what? This is not the way Christ is talking. Take a look you. at in 70 years how things have gone totally the opposite of what it used to be. Because Christians have set back on their doves and let the rest of the world get their way, the evil ways in which we're living today. Mm -hmm. We as Christians set back. I didn't realize what was going on for so long. I had no idea, but little by little, they just kept changing this little little thing here, little thing there, little, and they just kept on and then got where they've got the upper hand now, mm -hmm. or they think they've got the upper hand. Right. And, and when it comes to to the human race, they do have the upper hand because they've got, you know, I mean, uh, there's more evil in the world than there is good. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's the thing. Satan doesn't work. Jim's just pointing out how the shifting of society to a more you godless know, society and moral society has been a slow progression because Satan understands how things work. It's not like Eve was just, you know, living holy and righteous and following all of God's commands, working her, you know, part of the garden, and then Satan came and pulled her there. No, she had worked her way to the garden. He didn't just come out and say, eat from this tree, it'll make you powerful. He starts with the questioning. Did God, did he really mean you can't eat from any tree? You know, he makes you question God. And then whenever you question God, you begin to make little allowances. If you were to go back again, 60 years, Christians would not have a television in their home because television brought in bad influences. Especially in the bedroom and the kids. Exactly. And they, they, then we have now seven TVs in the house. We make slow progression. And as we go, we make compromises. So I'm going to pause this just for one second. All right, so the point being, the unwise, the rest of the world, when they, when they behave in a certain way, they're not looking to glorify God. They're not interested in glorifying God. But what about us Christians? If you ever find yourself questioning, is this really wrong? Let me give you a piece of advice. Yes, don't do it. If you have to ask yourself, is it wrong? It more than says, is. Yes, well, the thing is, Romans 14, 23, whatever is not a faith, is sin. Now that's a pretty big statement. I don't want to take this too far because people will misunderstand it. But if something is a sin for you, it may not be a sin for me. I'll have a glass of wine. That's a great example. I will have a glass of wine. But to the Christian who struggles with alcohol and it leads them down the wrong path and they are convinced that alcohol is a sin and they have that same glass of wine, it becomes a sin for them. So again, I don't take that logic too far. Say, well, then nothing's a sin for me. That's not how it works. There are, things that, there are things that are clearly taught. But the point being, if you question that this is not honoring God, don't try to convince yourself why it's okay to do. Just don't do it, right? Like, you know, I can do all things, but they're not. They're not all good things for me. Yes. And Danny's pointing out where uh, Paul, I think it was, that said, um, all things are allowable, but not all things are beneficial. Not, I mean, even though I can, doesn't mean I should. And especially not if it's causing my brother to sin. Even if it may not be a problem for me to have a glass of wine, if my brother is struggling with alcohol and, and he thinks it's a sin, I should not be drinking around him. I shouldn't be bringing it up or making it an issue. We, create, we don't want to create a stumbling block. Exactly. Uh, Yes. And it's a constant battle. It's constant and evil battle. Absolutely. And that's so the things we desire to do that we shouldn't do, that's the one thing we end up doing. And the Bible's like, no, you have to fight. Paul says you have to fight, you have to live for Christ, because 
this whole life, everything you do, you can throw away all of your rewards by giving in to your sins. Or you can start fresh. You can say, you know what? I have made mistake after mistake after mistake. But from this day forward, I am going to glorify God. Does that mean you'll never sin again? Of course not. You'll probably sin this after this evening, maybe tomorrow. But the point is, where is your heart? Where is your life? Are you working to glorify God every day? Sincerely trying. Sincerely trying. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Verse, owning it when you mess up. Owning it when you mess up. I wouldn't know, but I'm sure. Shane, you tell me. What's it like when you mess up? <laughs> I just think so. Um, Anyway, um, if they mess up, you should embrace that as yes, they messed up and they are wrong. Mm -hmm. Try to sweep it under the rug. Yes. Not, try to make it not minimize it. Absolutely. No, you they're wrong. Yes, it happened. Well, I have a great, I mean, I think you're exactly right. And what Annie's pointing out is we don't make excuses when Christians fail. We are not here to make other Christians look good. When people say, well, you Christians said, you know, you're right. And guess what? I'm the worst of them. But let me tell you about why you ought to be a Christian. It's because of Jesus Christ. If you want to see what Christianity is, look at Jesus Christ. Don't look at me. Charles Stanley, I think he's a great preacher, good Baptist preacher. He's got a lot of good messages out there, a lot of good books, a lot of good messages. He had a problem, you know, with his with his family. His wife wanted to leave him. Not by any thing that he did. It's just an unfortunate thing. But you know what he did, which I have so much respect for. He brought it up before the church. He's like, listen, biblically, I don't have any right to be the preacher. Biblically, here's where it is. And, you know, the Bible says you got to be the husband of one wife, have to have obedient children, have to do. He went and he laid it all out. Now, the church elders got together and they felt that the God was leading them to keep him in his position. That's the whole function of the church. The point is, mistakes can happen. Acknowledge them. Realize, yes, we are imperfect. But then trust in Christ. Then do what he wants. And we own our sins. We don't try to show ourselves as anything. When they came and said, oh, you know, please give me something. He's like, listen, give me silver. Give me gold. The beggar, right, at the temple. And Peter was like, listen, I, I don't have silver and I don't have gold. But I got one thing I can give. In the name of Jesus Christ, be healed. And that's something, I mean, think of the riches you have. You have the knowledge of eternal life. An escape to an eternity of suffering. I don't want to offend you. What a stupid excuse. I mean, what a stupid excuse. Just get rid of it. Oh, I'm nervous. So what? So what? What, are you going to offend them? They're not going to talk to you anymore? Wouldn't you rather save them from hell than not than talk to them next week? Who cares? I would build it up as such a big deal, but, you know, when Jesus talked to the woman at the well, mm -hmm. it was just... It's just a conversation. Mm -hmm. sure, and, you know, it, it, to me, that's simple. Yeah. It doesn't have to be this huge... Well, you know, look at how Jesus yeah. did it every time. John the Baptist did. Everybody talked like they would shift from the natural to the spiritual. And guess what? Mm -hmm. Sometimes people wanted nothing to do with it. That's okay. I'm not here That's to push like anything on you. Yeah. Exactly. The, the yep. And, and that, the best analogy is from that I like is from uh, Ray Comfort. Talks about being a little honeybee. Mm -hmm. And if you watch the honeybees or the bumblebees, they go from flower to flower to flower. Then they find a flower. And then they disappear inside of it. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why'd they skip all those other flowers? Well, they were looking for the nectar. And they went to one. There was no nectar here, no nectar here. And when they find one, they spend their time there. <clears throat> so the point is, bring up the ghost. You know, how are you today? I'm blessed. Oh, well, thank God. Oh, okay, this person's responding. Let me talk to him. You know, says, you know, God is so good. Have you been to church lately? If they don't want to talk, that's okay. We're not here to force them. But be ready always. Be instant, in season, out of season, to share the word of God. In Paul, he did. He shook the dust from the fields and he was... You know, in a town that wasn't accepting, that's what Jesus advised them to do, right? If they refuse, all right, walk away, take mm -hmm. the dust off your feet. We're not, we're not going to convince people into we're not going to trick them into heaven. But whenever they're listening, we should give them all of our energy and our effort because this are not life and death. If it was life and death, that's not a big deal. We're talking about eternal life and eternal suffering. 
That's what's at stake. So if people are willing to listen, be willing to speak. So then we get to verse 18. So it says, and be not drunk with wine, wherein, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So aside from fornication and all this wide variety of sins we've talked about, drunkenness is a pitfall for the Christian. It can destroy the witness of the Christian. Drinking an alcoholic beverage throughout the Bible, not a sin. All kinds of folks in the Bible drank wine. Jesus drank wine. But whenever there is excess, what does it mean when I have an excess of wine? What happens? It affects your behavior. It affects your behavior when you start getting get buzzed, getting intoxicated, right? When it becomes habit forming, when it offends another believer, we talked about that earlier. If in doubt, don't drink. If you're not sure whether this is okay, don't do it. That's pretty much what a good rule of thumb. Alcohol, the whole concept, when people go out to drink, what do they do it for? To have a good time, to relax. I deserve this. I earned this. Let me escape from work. It's an escape, right? Let me bring joy to my life for a short period of time. But as a Christian, where's your joy? Where's your joy come from? I already found in the love of Jesus. In the love of Jesus. We go to Christ for our escape. When we come home and we're frustrated, we talk with other Christians. We talk to other believers. We sing songs. We pray together. We praise God, right? We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not with alcohol. We're to have songs of thanksgiving and fellowship, giving thanks always and then also submitting ourselves one to another when you're frustrated and i'm tired i should say you know what no, i'm going to listen to your frustration i'm here for you we're brothers and sisters in christ when you're poor and i can afford to help you i'm here for you when you're stranded you need to borrow a vehicle or whatever i mean there's example after example every born again believer has received the holy spirit has been cleansed by the blood of christ Everybody has the Holy Spirit, but not every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. Not every Christian is doing the things. They're not emptying themselves every day of themselves so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. Problem is with most Christians is we already got too much stuff. And I'm not talking about how many couches you got. We got too much stuff taking up our heart and our time and too much stuff taking up our emotion. Well, I got to watch this show. I got to do this. Got to call my friends. Got to go out here. Guys, work is what we do so that we can afford to help others and serve Christ. That's what we do. It's not about well, all the stuff I want to do. We are supposed to be filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, how do you respond? You respond in singing and giving thanks. It's the natural outpouring of thankfulness for what Christ has done for you. So once we realize how thankful you are, now again, I'm not being critical, but some people, every time you talk, you can't get through a conversation with them without them saying, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, thank Jesus. Oh, bless God. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but the point is it doesn't have to be with words. I can be thankful without telling everyone I'm thankful. Being thankful is a state of heart. It's not a method of speaking, right? So whenever the Bible says, notice how it says in verse uh, uh, 19. Speaking to who? Yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody where? In your heart. Doesn't mean, I mean, I know my wife really enjoys hearing me belt out the loudest I can as we're driving down the road, but that's not what this is talking about. What is the song in your heart speaking to yourself? I don't have to tell the world how thankful and blessed I am. I can show them by just being thankful and knowing that I'm blessed. And then it's going to come through. It absolutely will come through. When you look at people who go out and they use alcohol to bring them joy, guess how quickly that joy fades? Pretty quick. It's pretty quick. And the next day, they're just as miserable, maybe more so than they were the day before. What is it? The next morning. The next morning, right? Um, but, you know, the human 
whenever we think about like, what is the human condition? We're always looking for something to bring us happiness. Salvation brings joy, but you have to choose to receive that joy, or you can choose to still try to fill it in with all your stuff. Paul, the whole time we're reading this book, he's talking about submitting yourselves to one another, talking about unity. Well, how do you have unity? How does anyone have unity? It's through submission. We always, as humans, want to seek our own good. We always want what's best for us. But the command of our creator is to do what's best for others. Seek the good of others. Lift up others. Lift up our brothers and sisters. Esteem one another as better than yourselves. Do you have any idea how hard that is to do? It's a hard thing to do. It's all about you. Self-esteem, right? Yeah. Society wants you to do the opposite. But no, the Bible says no. Look for the help of look for to help others. How else are you going to show love? How can you show anybody that you love them? How does a man show a woman that he loves her, that he's interested in her? What's he do? He says, I'm going to take my money and I'm going to buy you dinner. I'm going to take my money and take you to a movie that you can enjoy or you to an amusement park. That's how he shows her his affection. And you can just show any time when you want to show love, you take of yourself and you give to someone else. That's both true within the marriage relationship. That's true within any relationship. I'm taking a me to give to you. When you want to see a vibrant living church, you're going to see a church that's constantly submitting one to another. Constantly. But whenever you see a church where two or three people do all the work and everyone else just shows up, be a church like anything else and it'll be dead in two generations. Almost guaranteed, right? So we have to remember submission, submission, submission. Then we get to the final section of the chapter. So the final section talks about how my wife ought to treat me. And so she's not, she's not even here. That's why I'm saying it. So, <laughs> so verse 22 through 33, we'll read it all in one, one fell swoop. It says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, for he is the sa- and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So that's three verses to the wife, right? Let's see what the husband has to say. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. He's got a lot to say to husband, a lot more than he's got to say to wives, frankly. And he says in the last couple of verses, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning um, Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife that see that she reverence her husband. So Paul talks about this personal relationship between the husband and the wife. He talks about how the wife he says, submit to the leadership of the husband. You've heard the the statement, two heads are better than one. That's a true statement. Unless they're on the same body, then it's a monster, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, I mean, two heads are better than one. You should always be talking and working together and being unified in your approach. But sometimes there's going to be disagreements. And when it comes to leadership roles in the home, God, from the time of Eve's fall, Till today has given that leadership role to the husband. But there is a specific, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Restriction on that. There's a specific uh, guideline guideline on when that is true. That is not true across the board. He is speaking to the God-fearing Christians who are living a God-fearing life. So many people 
want to rip things out of context. They want to take a passage and say, ha ha, see, submit yourself. It says so right here. Yeah. Who's he talking to? I, wife, submit yourself to the man who's willing to die for you. Wife, submit yourself to the man who's willing to take of whatever he wants for himself and give it up so he can give it to you. That's the woman. That's the man that the wife ought to be submitting herself to. It's not just across the board. Hey, bring me my beer. That's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about something else. So Christ is a righteous leader. He's comparing the wife to the church. My kid's acting funny here. So you, know, you can probably see her in the camera. But um, we're talking about how we as a church submit ourselves to Christ. And how does Christ in turn treat the church? Is Christ abusive? Is Christ seeking damage to the church? Is he trying to get just servants out of the church? Or is he serving the church? Do you remember when the disciples came by and their feet were dirty? Who did he tell to get up and wash the feet? Who did he tell? He got up and washed the feet. Exactly. He said, I'm here to serve. So a submissive wife would only be beneficial and godly if she's submitting to a godly husband. It's conditional on the fact that the husband is to love the wife as Christ loved the church. The cleansing of the believer, we're not talking about water baptism, not in this passage. We're talking about the cleansing of the, by the word of God. By, so as the husbands, are you spiritually leading your wives? As the husbands, are you picking up the Bible and say, guys, hey, no, this is the cornerstone of our faith. It's Jesus Christ. Let's read the word together. Let's study the Bible. Let's grow together spiritually. Are you bringing them to faith? Are you encouraging their faith? Many, again, if you can't understand the love of Christ, if somebody is unsaved, this passage is not biblical advice. This is not marriage advice, excuse me. This is speaking to the saved. You can't extrapolate this to the unsaved. Because if you don't know the love of Christ, how can you give that love to your wife? You cannot. You need to have both. So we show love. And what is love? We already mentioned. Full submission to one another. That's what love is. So men ought to love their wives as if as they love their own body. So through, because through a man's love for the bride, he makes her more beautiful. Do you see that passage up above? So it said that, um, let me find it. That in verse 27 says that he might present it to himself, talking about Jesus loving the church, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that should be holy and without blemish. The purpose of Christ's love is to glorify the church. What is the purpose of a husband's love? To glorify the wife, to make the wife greater, more beautiful. Let her know she's appreciated how great she is to him. So again, what is the Christian supposed to be? Truly loving your wife is loving yourself. Because as they say, happy wife, happy life. Happy life. All the men know that one. That's a good one. Um, happy wife, happy life. If you nourish and cherish your wife, you're loving yourself. That's how you love yourself. And you improve, frankly, the quality of your own life. Again, remember what Jesus did for his bride. What did he do? He was on the cross. He let himself die so that she might live. Why? So she could be holy and blameless and that he could have fellowship with us for eternity. So the purpose of marriage, the whole purpose of marriage is to produce godly children and even more so to have a godly relationship, to have an eternal relationship. That's what marriage is all about. Christ submitted himself to die on the cross so that he could live forever with his church. Um, and when you understand the true nature of marriage, you can understand the relationship of Jesus with the church. I think, again, marriage is something very misunderstood or poorly understood by the world, for sure, and even so by the church. We always think of marriage as, oh, I like you. You like me. Great. Let's spend even more time together. And that's, that's what people generally, that's about what sums up marriage. We have a good time together. We really enjoy each other's company. It's way, way deeper than that. Think back to the first husband and the first wife. Do you remember their names? Adam. Adam and Eve. Very good. Adam was given a universe. 
to explore and to control. And he got to see all of the animals ever created, all the land animals, all the birds. God creates one more right in front of him. And he gets to name each one of them. And he's looking for this perfect mate, this perfect match for him, a help that's perfect or custom for him. A help meet is the word in the King James. And he can't find one. So then what happens to him? He's put into this death-like sleep. We would think of it as anesthesia these days, right? He was put into a death-like sleep in Genesis 2. And then, just for lack of a better term, he was pierced in his side, right? And through his wound, his rib was removed, right? And from his body creates what? The perfect match. He creates his bride by his side being pierced while he's dead, right? And he gets this perfect woman, gives her life, perfects her. And she comes to live with him. And why? So they can have a relationship for all of time. That's what it was supposed to be, remember? It was supposed to be forever <clears throat> in paradise. The bride was formed. And of course, as we know, what's this mirror? This mirror is Jesus. He went on the cross. He died. He was pierced in his side. And through his wound, the church was born. Yes. You can look at it. Good. Um, so the, and then what happens? He's like, he says, a man leaves his father and his mother to cleave to his wife, and they become one flesh. He just quotes it here. Well, remember, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ left his father for how long? Remember, when a, when a man leaves his parents to, to join with his wife, it's a permanent thing mm -hmm. it's forever you don't go back to live with your parents no you are now living with your wife you have a new family what did jesus give up to dwell with us his glory i mean think about that he became a man now he's still god but he's still he became a man and when does he get to go back from being a man never never, never. he will remain a man for eternity now, he is still God. Don't misunderstand. But think about the change he made. When he returns at his second coming, what do the Israelites see? Where did you get those scars? Think about that. He will forever be man. Why? To what end? Why? He could have just redeemed us and let us live forever in heaven. No, no. He says, you can't see God's face and live. Even in heaven, you cannot see God's face and live. But you know what? God will become a man and will forgive you and he will dwell with you forever. Think of that relationship, the marriage relationship. A man will leave his father and his mother so that he will cleave to his wife, inseparable. We don't even have the slightest clue. We do not even barely begin to understand. It what says, it is he's done for us. Let us make man in our image. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is in bodily form. Right. Jesus became a man. Became a 100% man. Now he's also 100% God. But he became a man to dwell with man. That's the purpose and the end result of all this. So that we can spend eternity with him. And he can have fellowship with us. It's incredible. But you said it too. We cannot see the face of God and live. Right, unless God became a man. <clears throat> we can't see the face of God and live unless God became a man. What about the Father? No man has seen the Father, according to Jesus. Everyone they've ever seen throughout the Old Testament has been the Son. Everyone, according to Jesus. It's interesting, because they've still seen God, because I and the Father are one, right? Sorry, go ahead. Moses saw him walking away, and even then he walked him passing by, and he covered his eyes, yeah, right? Covered right, and there was, and at him. yeah, and uh, Gideon also had saw the angel of God. He said, I've seen the face of God. I'm going to die. And he's like, don't worry, you won't die. How about this one? Isaiah, I think it was Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah goes into the temple, and he's there in the temple, and he sees the God. He's like, oh, I'm going to have seen God. I can't be in here. No one's allowed in the temple except the high priest, right? I'm going to die. So what happens? They bring a burning coal off the altar. And they put it on his mouth. Right? And he was made clean. Says your sin has been taken away. What is the burning coal? It's the representation of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. 
Everything else that we've touched, if we go near a dead body, if we go near leprosy, if we go near bodily fluids, we become unclean. But when we touch Christ, we be, he makes us clean. We don't make him unclean. He makes us clean. So the fact is, though, in order for him to redeem us, he had to become a man. That's a heavy, just to become a man is the heavy price to pay. And then to die and be brutally destroyed by us, by us, the ants believe beneath his feet. What love. There's a song. And all songs really speak to me. It says, behold, what manner of love. What manner of love. God has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. I mean, I don't think you can capture it. I don't think you can understand it. And it blows your mind to even think about it. I don't think that our minds can really comprehend it. They cannot. They never will. Our minds cannot comprehend it. That's correct. So back to the marriage thing. Today, we take marriage very lightly. We often will get married quickly without really knowing who we're marrying. Um, whenever things start to fall apart, what do we do? We say, all right, I'm done. I'm walking away. But again, just be careful. And I, this is just a side advice. Don't try to apply, A, these guidelines to non-Christian relationships. These guidelines are not for that. And not only non-Christian relationships, non-Christian relationships that are not living in godly ways. There are a lot of Christians. I mean, does God intend for somebody to live under, you know, the terms of abuse and neglect? Does God, you know, intend for someone to, this is, that is something for you and your church and the elders of your church to work through. Don't try, a lot of people will use these guidelines to criticize and bash other Christians. That's not your place. God has church leadership for a purpose and for a reason. And, you know, even church leadership has been known to make mistakes. So we got to be, again, use the Bible as our guide. So marriage in general, my guidelines for marriage, approach it with reverence. And dissolve it only with great consideration and a whole lot of prayer and biblical guidance. And that comes from other Christians. But the one thing I'll advise everyone, don't judge from the sidelines. Don't sit there and look at other people and think you know. The picture people present in public is very rarely the picture that goes on behind closed doors. Very rarely. I know everyone thinks I'm the perfect guy. And in that instance, fine, you're right. But there are some instances where that is not true. I'm so <laughs> I'm very humble. Yes, thank you, Wayne. Um, so again, if you're going to consider marriage, and this is my this is my advice to anyone who's watching this, just talking about getting married, on your first date, surprise her with something called a prayer, and from every date henceforth, pray. And whenever you're going to go and you're going to go out to a movie or to a nice dinner. Say, hey, we're also going to take an extra 15 minutes to do a quick chapter reading of the Bible. Or let's listen to this audio Bible. Let's listen to this devotion. Make Jesus the cornerstone of your relationship. Make him the focus of what brings you together. Pray together. Read the Bible together. Confess sins. Maybe, maybe to one another, maybe to others, but do so while you're, while you're together. Attend church together. Make God a priority from day one. And he'll stay a priority till the last day. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't want to keep going off on a tangent. We kind of left the whole chapter. But the last tangent I'll say, a lot of people don't think that we stay married in heaven. A lot of people take one passage where Jesus was answering the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus into proving that there was no eternity. And they said, well, what if a man marries a woman and then the man dies and then his brother marries and his brother and his brother and his brother and all of a sudden they have seven husbands? What happens? And Jesus answers them. He's like, guys, you're being silly. In eternity, we're not married or given in marriage, but you're like the angels of God. The misunderstanding was because people are saying, look, nobody's married in heaven. That's not what he's saying. The question was, whose wife is she in eternity? Because the limited understanding of the Sadducees was a marriage has to do with a sexual relationship. In heaven, you are not procreating. Believers are good friends. You can't have no fun, no. But <laughs> the point being, me and Carly are best friends. And in eternity, we will be best friends. In eternity, we will go and see the people, the loved ones that have accepted Christ, that we want, that we're looking forward to seeing. We're just, David looked forward to seeing his child. 
That doesn't mean like in heaven, we're not fathers and children. My dad, I will see in heaven if he dies before me. And guess what? We won't be father, son. We'll be brothers. And our father will be Christ. And me and Carly, we won't be married trying to take care of the house and raise the children. No, we'll be brother and sister. Thank God, right? It is paradise. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is, we'll be together, but we won't be trying to have children. No, we'll be brother and sister praising the Lord. So we still have a relationship. We're still together. You will all still be my friends and my brothers and my sisters in heaven. We don't just all of a sudden not know anybody. That's not what he's saying. They just want to take it right out of context. Yeah. So the point being, relationships matter. Christians ought to be living by the biblical teachings. And when you are, it's easy to submit to one another. Imagine if I literally do everything from the minute I come home to give my wife strength, to help her, to, to give her the best over what I want, and she's doing the same for me. How happy can we be? But instead, our selfishness gets in the way. That wraps up my comments on Ephesians chapter 6.